Now that Andrew's car's making over 300 kilowatts of the wheels, the factory airflow meters are really struggling and run out of range. It's time to go to a map sensored style tuning solution on this car using the Haltech Platinum Pro Series as a direct plug-in ECU. Now, this is going to allow us to either remove or unplug the factory airflow meters, tune the car off the map sensor, and do all of our closed loop functions, including closed loop boost control, closed loop wide bent O2 control, as well as tuning the car using the flex composition sensor. So whatever volume of ethanol is in the fuel, we can tune the fuel, ignition, and boost control, depending. The Platinum Pro plug-in is a direct plug-in ECU. So if we plug it straight into our R32 GDR, the car will start and run off the factory airflow meters. But like we've talked about, in this case, the factory airflow meters are maxed out. So we're actually gonna be wiring in a three bar or 30 pound external map sensor. Now, we could use the internal map sensor. This one's good up to 22 PSI. Andrew wants to run a little bit more than that. So that's the reason for wiring our external sensor. All right, so all we're gonna do first, you just go online with the ECU. We're going to load in one of the default maps that's available for either airflow meter or map sensor. So we're going to load a map sensor base map into it. We're going to change your injector size and we're going to set up the input that we've wired the map sensor to. You can't really argue with that as a first startup. With the Howtech Platinum Plug and Play installed, it was off to CRD to get it tuned. With the base timing checked and some magic on the laptop, the power runs began. With more precise control over fuel and ignition, and no more maxed out airflow meters, we were able to pick up 20 kilowatts just by switching to the Howtech. The extra safety parameters in the Howtech meant Jim could turn the wick up a little further safely as the car will reduce timing and boost based on intake air temps and water temps. The factory knock sensor can also be more precisely read. With over 350 kilowatts, we now had maxed out the 550cc injectors inside the factory rail. Time to upgrade the fuel system. With so many options out there to upgrade your fuel system, it's hard to know where to start. So we worked out exactly what we needed and this is the list we came up with. With E85 on the card, we would need at least 50% more flow in the injectors, plus more fuel flow from the back of the car up to the rail. We contacted Six from Quick Fits in Melbourne to choose some new injectors. He recommended the new Bosch 1100cc injector as they have the same plug as the RB26 factory injector and with the right adapter and O-rings are a straight bolt-in affair for the RB26 fuel rail and work great. To get more flow to the injectors, we decided to keep the factory rail so the bay looks stock but modify it to be a twin entry rail. To help up the base pressure to suit the Bosch injectors and handle the extra flow, we installed a TurboSmart FPR800 fuel pressure regulator with a gauge. We used their adapter to delete the factory reg and gauge to monitor the pressures. Finished in black and hidden away, it's kept nice and discreet. With the fuel in the bay complete, we still needed to get enough fuel from the tank to the bay and stop fuel surge. So, we contacted one of the best in the business, Aftermarket Industries, for one of their fuel system solutions. We went for the complete 2.6 litre kit with Holly Dominator pump. The surge tank is made from 3mm laser cut and CNC folded aluminium and TIG welded to perfection. We were quite impressed with the finish of the welds and the black anodizing. The rubber O-ringed bulkhead can be rotated to face any direction, making running fuel lines easier, and the welded on fittings give plenty of scope for different size adapters and lines. The ports also have an etched label, which is a great little touch. One little trick the guys from Aftermarket Industries did on our surge tank was fit two E85 compatible Earl's fuel filters inside the surge tank. This not only saves on plumbing and space outside the tank, also acts as a baffle, stopping fuel slosh. Very clever. 
The base plate is also laser cut and CNC folded and is a very nice touch for the complete kit, making mounting much easier in our application. The Holly Dominator 1800 is technically two pumps in one housing, allowing staged operation. It is E85 compatible and can flow 630 litres per hour at 70 psi, meaning it can handle between 850 and 1150 horsepower depending on the fuel and setup, which is more than enough for us. The kit also comes with black AN fittings and black braided line to link the tank and the pump, once again making installation easier. We simply put some nut certs in the floor of the boot up the back and simply bolt it in the plate. We then purchased and ran black braided lines with Earl's AN fittings behind the trim. So the engine bay would look stock, we used the factory return line as a second feed line for the twin entry rail and then installed a Dash 8 return braided fuel line. As you can see, the boot install is neat and tidy and could be hidden with a carpeted false firewall if need be and the fuel system in the engine bay looks factory to the untrained eye. Mission accomplished. Our next step was to visit Howtech to have the flex fuel sensor wired up and calibrated. The Howtech software comes loaded with calibration tables for fuel, so you could essentially pour in some ethanol to any mix and the ECU would automatically add the correct fuel from your base pump fuel map. The timing and boost is left unchanged as the tuner needs to do it to suit each combination. With the 2014 Motive DVD GTR Challenge at Cootamundra only days away, we headed to CRD to tune the car. With the new fuel system, we had to essentially retune the car on 98 octane fuel first. The fuel system now had no problem coping with the power and was nowhere near the limits like it used to be. With ethanol about to be used, we decided to turn the power down on 98 slightly for better reliability and ended up with 333 kilowatts on 20 psi. Still pretty good for a stock engine with cams and Dash 7 turbos. We then started to add ethanol to the tank, first checking at E50 and then again at just over E60. With the same boost and changes to timing only, power easily jumped to 355 kilowatts at the wheel. Only an extra 2 psi saw power then jump to 368 kilowatts. The extra cooling and knock resistance of E85 enabling this boost with ease. We then added a little more ethanol to bring it up closer to E70, which is what we plan on running anyway, and added in some more boost. <laughs> 383 kilowatts and a whole lot more mid-range was the final result, giving a massive improvement. Proof, once again, that ethanol blended fuel is one of the best performance upgrades you can perform. The factory wastegate means the boost does spike to approximately 26 psi before dropping off to 24. The turbos have a little left in them, but it's the law of diminishing returns, and we are past what we call the safe limit of a stock head gasket and stock head studs. The flex fuel sensor now means we can put anything from 98 octane through to E85 in the tank with any mix in between, avoiding annoying tank drains when we want to switch. At Cootamundra, it was time to see if the extra mid-range and top-end power would lead to real-world performance gains. Last time we were here, we ran a 12.4 at 118 with 284 kilowatts. With an old set of street tyres underneath, our aim was to run around the 11.4 mark and between 124 and 126 miles per hour. A realistic goal for our car's power and modification level. <laughs> shocked when the first run was 11.27 at 129.7 miles per hour. A lot of other people watching were shocked too. 
on the slippery surface, we recorded a 1.8760 footer, but we thought we could do better. <laughs> I knew it was quicker. I knew it was quicker. An 11.07 at 130 miles per hour was insanely quick and insanely fast for the car's power and setup, leaving a few people scratching their heads, including us. Even we are still a little shocked by the performance of the stock 26 with drop in cams, dash 7 turbos, and support gear. It really is a testament to the tuning of Jim from CID and the selection of the right parts rather than the most expensive parts from our trusted Motive Garage partners. We now had the 10 second bug and went to try again. And again. And again. And again. That 10 second pass remained elusive, not bettering our 11 flat. But running six passes between 11.0 and 11.3 and between 128 and 130 miles per hour prove the car is also consistent and reliable. We then decided to head to Sydney Dragway for a Wednesday night test and tune and a bit of a drag battle reunion to see what would happen on a prep track. The only thing we changed from Cootamundra was a new set of Achilles 123S tyres as the pair were simply worn out after two years on the car. With a very well used two year old single plate clutch in the car, we decided to run high tyre pressures and keep the four wheel drive controller to stock for the least amount of grip on the first pass to try and help the clutch survive. <laughs> We've had two runs. I will admit after Cootamundra, I am really trying to crack that 10. Didn't know what to expect with the grip here or what the clutch would do. Got a pretty terrible 60 footer, only a 1.9 on the first run, but went 11.3, 135. So the mile an hour was a lot more than I expected. Second run, hardened the back, turned up a bit of four wheel drive, still axle tramp, drove through it though, and went 11.1 at 136, but still a 1960 footer. So, Third run, I'm going to go soft on the suspension on the back, see if that helps, and I'm going to turn the four-wheel drive right up, and let's hope for that 10. Let's, let's try and do it. 
I tried three different setups to get the car to 60 better and uh, none of them worked at the drag strip so even though the car hooks up beautiful on the street does 1.8 1.760s on the v-box at cuda in the street just couldn't get it to work on the last run i tried all the four-wheel drive tried soft still axle tramped but because i rode it more i also melted the clutch a little bit which meant i had to have a, quite a few stabs at a couple of gears it still went 11 2 128 so you could see that i missed a gear in it and um yeah just that one run just did not work so uh plan is now the, the boys have said come borrow a set of radials and uh try and get that 10 if you want but you know what i really want to do it the way i drive it so uh we might give it one more go <laughs> 